Hi everyone, I think we've got pretty much everybody in. Um, a really warm welcome and thank you very much for joining us again this evening for our latest online talk, <coughs> which explores modernist architecture and its influence on animals. Our speaker tonight is Philippa Ramos, a writer and curator who has a keen interest in ecology, who joins us live from Porto. Without further ado, I will hand over to Philippa and let her get straight into her talk, which should be really, really interesting. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will do a Q&A at the end. If you can keep your microphones off during the talk, that would be fantastic. Um, but feel free to write questions throughout and you'll have another opportunity to do so at the end of the talk. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Dan, for this wonderful invitation and for and thank you to the team at Delaware for organizing this and for trusting me to to come here and, and to spend some time with you sharing my research. Um, I'm slightly concerned because while Dan was speaking, I, I received a video message slightly broken. So um, Dan, I will just ask you if by any chance the connection is interrupted or you stop hearing me, just let me know so that I can, I can make sure that I'm speaking in the best possible condition. Of course. Um, and so the reason why I've been invited here um, is it, it concerns an area of my research that has very, has very much been um, involved in understanding the ongoing dialogue and relationship that exists between traditions of um, exhibiting art, um, exhibiting nature, even if nature is such a complex term, um, both alive and non, and thinking about the relationships between art history, exhibition studies, museum studies, and um, traditions of uh, framing and displaying the natural within museological environments. Also thinking, well, for those of us like me who have a background in art history, we tend to think, or at least I tended to think, that art has the monopoly of the exhibitionary as an as a format and as an apparatus to share visions, to share materials, experience and contents. And, um, and I find extremely interesting, but extremely important as well to understand the different traditions that have related to the model of the, of the exhibition, to the format and the possibilities of the format of the exhibition as a site for encounter, for debate, for sharing of ideas, for, um, but also um, for certain frictions and tensions to, to happen and to manifest themselves through material and immaterial decisions that are made when an exhibitionary apparatus is set in place. And while interested in these, in these different dialogues and different traditions, um, I started, Let's say I started with a sort of a conspiracy theory where I started asking myself if it would be possible to locate within the exhibitionary apparatus um, a certain reinforcement or even a certain naturalization of a, the ongoing debate on the division on the nature-culture divide. That is, I started asking myself, would it be possible that the division, the conceptual, perceptual, uh, philosophical division between nature and culture uh, could have been enforced, reinforced, and uh, naturalized by the exhibitionary apparatus, which by relying on material, immaterial as well, but on material 
surfaces of encounter, but also of separation, enforced this notion that there is a distinction, very clear distinction between nature and culture. That is, is it possible that by relying on such supports as a vitrine uh, or um, a cage, like metal bars or a glass uh, surface, or even a screen, which is a sort of a membrane, the exhibitionary apparatus was determining that which was being observed, looked at, studied, analyzed, contemplated, um, and which was supposedly placed in a passive um, position, was considered an object, you know, and that who could decide where to position oneself, how to look, where to look from, how long to look from to look for and how to see was considered a subject and had an agency that therefore placed them in the place of the cultural while the others, let's say, were exactly others and turned into objects and into elements that had no culture, no history, were considered um, closer to the, the realm of the natural world. And so um, in this, throughout this investigation of, let's say, this conspiracy theory and imagining if the exhibitionary apparatus could indeed have, um, have an important role in reinforcing and naturalizing this perceptive separation of nature and culture, which defines so much of the process of consolidation of modernity and defines so much of how we still today relate to the world around us and we humans relate to other living forms, other species, and even humans that for long have been considered others, no, they have been others. I started investigating certain sites where these experiences and where these exhibitionary models have been developed, have been experimented, and have been reinforced um, to, to exactly try to understand what kind of experiences have they created. Experiences of observation, experiences of amusement and pleasure as well, experiences of research and investigation, of learning, but also of entertaining. Um, and to understand how these experiences have conditioned um, the, it, the relationships, the affects, the forms of knowledge that emerged through them. And one of the sites that I consider, um, that I've chosen as a privileged site for this investigation and, and, and for these questions was exactly the site of the zoological garden, the zoo. Um, because on the one hand, um, I was interested in understanding how come in a moment of such important and um, let's say fairly systematic questioning of structures that remained from imperialistic colonial rhetorics and regimes that were being questioned and were being demolished and were being investigated, how come within this environment, the zoological garden remained a site that was, that remained fairly unquestioned and fairly untouched by these different uh, waves of deconstructing of the colonial institution, and in particular, of its relationship to, to traditions of um, music, of, of in, in relation to exhibitionary traditions. And so on the one hand, I was thinking, what is there in the zoo that makes it so resistant to a, a deconstructive, a critical uh, influence that is um, permeating with much necessity 
many other areas of uh, where the exhibitionary apparatus is um, also a dominant form of, of exchange and of presentation. And on the other hand, exactly asking what kind of experiences are there triggered by this zoological garden? Um, and, and have they changed? Have they not changed? And what have been the traditions of critically uh, encountering uh, the, the space um, and the environment of the zoo and those who, who live there? No? Um, I'm going to share some images. So I'm going, you're going to see me in the back, I think. Um, Um, I'm going to share some images that uh, relate, that document um, present and recent and present sites of zoological displays and zoological exhibitions. Uh, and I'm going to go through them to, um, to get to a moment that was crucial in my investigation and to then move forward and situate myself in relation to the uh, architecture of the London Zoo and its consolidation in throughout the 20th century. Um, and these images see them as sort of a, a remembrance of the kinds of encounters, the kind of visual and haptic um, experiences that one has when going to the zoo in its contrasting um, visions of the softness and the attractiveness of these animal bodies and their size, their uniqueness, their rarity, you know? and also the, the experience of the environments that, that surround them. You know? When I look at these images, I often think um, about, um, why isn't this? about John Burgess, declaration John Berger wrote in the early 1980s this important one of the still today considered one of the most important texts on on the experience of the zoo called why look at animals and one of the most remarkable questions among many others that he asks is or that he not even a question one of his most important statements is exactly that he he argues that zoos cannot but disappoint because what we're going to look um, for, what we desire to encounter is impossible because on the one hand, there is the animal who denies this experience of, uh, of encounter and of relationship. And on the other hand, the whole setting is, not, is also not allowing for such an experience to take place given the fact that it just doesn't allow us to forget, to ignore um, that we are in a site that is utterly constructed and adapted for a human experience and that is framing and conditioning the mode in which these animals are observed and in which these animals are presented, no? And, and, um, in, in environments that, as we will discuss, are very often highly constructed and very, uh, di very different from those which we romantically and not could associate with their, um, with the, these animals' original science. So exactly thinking about the experience of the visitor the experience of the encounter with the animal in the zoos. I've, I've made a selection of images that more often than not, they attend more to the display conditions than to the animals themselves, or they, they, they stay in, in between, no? in which we see how these animals are framed and how more than encountering, having an encounter with a wild, creature, we see a creature that has been, that is an entertainment animal that has been um, presented in such a way that is highly constructed and whose movements and, and, and freedom are also highly limited.
This is an image by Stanley Kubrick, which I find fascinating because uh, it creates an occasion for us to reflect on who's looking on at who, no? and when these exchanges of gazes happen, they also exactly by being located on the other side of this confinement space of um, of this creature, we also um, are, we also face our own the gaze that we often subject these animals to, and and just have this reverted perspective, which I find really interesting. And it was exactly while studying these encounters that I that I came across a text by a, an anthropologist that has been really influential for my thinking and my research. He's called Gregory Bateson. And Bateson, at a certain point in, a, in one of the most famous books he published, which is called Steps for an Ecology of Mind, um, on a, a chapter which is called The Theory of Play and Fantasy, Gregory Bateson um, re recalls how he is investigating the relationship between play and language and playfulness and language. Um, and he decides to go to the zoo of San Francisco, where he was living, to study um, expressions of play and expressions of fantasy in zoo animals. And he decides to go there. And in his description, he says that he goes to look at how, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting, how any given organism responds to language and play. And in fact, then he mentions that he goes to the Monkey Island in the San Francisco Zoo, which is the space that you're looking at right now, which was destroyed in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And actually, he went, he didn't go to see any given organism, whatever that meant, but he went to observe a group of spider monkeys, which is what we're seeing here, and how these spider monkeys were interacting with one another to understand how expressions of play are articulated in such a way that aggressiveness is mediated and tempered um, in such manner that two individuals who are entering what we could call a system of play fight in which they're playing with one another while they're fighting, have the capacity to communicate to one another that the fight that they are fighting is actually play and not fight. And he's interested in actually, he was interested in understanding these very subtle distinctions between communication, expression, fiction, and play to comprehend what are the linguistic and metalinguistic mechanisms through which something we express can actually have a, a meaning that is very different from um, something very similar that we express in some in some other way. But Regardless of this, what worried me and what disturbed me in, in Bateson's attitude, which was the fact that he believed that he could go to a zoo and spend some time looking at animals in a state of confinement in the zoo and still extract some valid information for his own research. And this for me was the starting point to start to investigate how come, uh, a thinker who is so engaged in nature, such as Gregory Bateson, how can he fall prey of the exhibitionary apparatus and rhetoric of the zoo, ignoring the fact that by being limited in terms of space, by having their behavior radically transformed by the place where, are, where they display, it's by the monkeys in nature, they would divide in several smaller groups and they would spend their day foraging and looking for fruit. And then they would return and gather again at the end of the day and sleep together. And by having, for instance, food provided um, and having no space to forage and no kind of natural environment apart from the one that we're seeing in this image, the behavior of these animals is highly conditioned and highly altered. So how could Bateson expect to get valid, scientifically valid information while doing these observations in the site that is already altering 
the possibility of the questions, of the answers and the questions that he's posing to these animals. And so it's exactly by trying to understand the modes of perception and apperception that are induced and created by the exhibitionary apparatuses of the zoos that I decided to start to investigate them and also to investigate their, the relationship between their architectonic constructions, the, their notions of space and the ideologies that connected to them and um, looking at specific case studies to do so. And um, one of the case studies that um, I seemed most interesting to me uh, was also one that was very close to, to me when I was doing this research, which was the history of the modern architecture of the London Zoo. And I've chosen that because it is a site that combines um, that combines a history of the early experimentations of modernist architecture and its import and translation and rendering with, within a British context with a relationship to uh, politics or geopolitics in a certain moment throughout the, of the early 20th century with a series of considerations uh, and innovations in relation to knowledge of animal welfare and um, animal exhibition in the context of um, of, you, of of zoological gardens. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to spend some time just referring some relevant uh, moments within the history of modernization of the London Zoo. Um, and reflecting on how they, these, this history is also a small slice of a history of, of Europe's 20th, 20th century and how it was, um, and how it evolved, let's say. So what, what is, what I find fascinating, let's say, is that in, in the mid in the early 1930s, early mid 1930s because of the situation in Europe and in particularly in in Germany what we find is that in London we encounter living moving to London and living in London for several years we encounter a series of key figures that were associated with that incredible school for design and crafts, or for the dialogue between design and crafts, that is the Bauhaus, no? which was founded by Walter Gropius in 1919, which was headed in, in which was first uh, based in Weimar, and which lasted until 1933 with the, um, with the change of, of politics in Germany and the ascension of, of national socialism in Germany, the school closed. And three of its key figures exactly, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and Laszlo Moholy-Nagy moved to, to the UK, moved to London, where they were living. They were living close to, to Hampstead in, in the same block of, of flats, which is called Long Rose Flats in, in Hampstead. And while they were living in, in London and understanding what to do with their life and then deciding the, the three of them decided to move to the US where they continued with their academic duties. Um, and while they were in London, um, they got, by a very interesting uh, turn of fate, they became extremely close with a series of biologists and zoologists who were very closely related to the London Zoo. And so um, what is exactly fascinating is seeing how these faculty members from the Bauhaus Design School who had fled um, Nazi harassment and had decided to move to, to London uh, were so closely related to these figures that were shaping new approaches to zoo zoology and biology and 
it's a zoological exhibition in London, namely um, an ecologist who was called Julian Huxley, who was the secretary of the Zoological um, Society in, in London, and who actually lived inside the, the London Zoo, um, and who saw this proximity with these Bauhaus members as a unique occasion to rethink the traditional architecture and the traditional design of the London Zoo and to rethink and redesign these structures. What we're seeing here is exactly the penguin pool that was redesigned, was one of the first buildings to be redesigned during this period. And to think how it would be possible to adapt modern architecture in its forms, in its belief, in its contribute to the emancipation of, of life, of people and, and non-humans alike, and in its functional design to improve the living conditions of, of individuals. So basically, the London Zoological Society, in close association with these architects, decided to think of the site of the London Zoo as an early, early site of modernization to try to understand if it would be possible to prove that modern architecture and an architecture that such as the Bauhaus believed that the function and form of design are key to establish an, a harmonic organic relationship with the so that there was a, a very close relationship between um, architecture and natural environment um, and how they could prove um, the benefits of an overall modernization of space, of cities, of urban dwellings that by being first experimented and tested on animal in inhabitants would prove that there would be that there was the possibility for the improvement of the living conditions of people. No? And so basically an architecture, why is this not? Give me a second. An architecture um, whose function is not only that of being hygiene, clean, hygienic, but also of allowing the individuals who occupy it and who live in it to live according to a balance with, uh, with nature. And also by being inspired in forms that occur naturally in, um, in the natural world, that occur in the natural world, that could also the forms of this modern architecture be made as following these principles, techniques, and processes and that can be applied to society. So several buildings during the early 1930s were commissioned to different architects. Um, several buildings of, of uh, the London Zoological Society, both in the, the site of the London Zoo in, in North London, but also in the, the major site of the London Zoological Society, which was the Whipsnet Zoo outside London. I'm showing here some examples. Uh, one of them, which is this one that we're seeing here, is the Penguin Pool, um, which was built exactly using this Bauhaus style to show how these animals could thrive in modern, novel environments that were completely disconnected from any association we would have with how the penguins would live in, in their um, so-called natural environment, and which was built by um, another emigre architect, Berthold Lubetkin, who co-founded a design company called Tecton. Tecton, uh, it's a Greek term that is sort of a, a short name for architecton, you know, for building or architecture. And so Tecton was the first architecture firm to try to experiment with applying concrete uh, to building. Um, and to architecture. And the idea of the penguin pool was exactly to experiment with the most radical forms possible to create an environment 
for these penguins that allow for them to circulate, for them to exercise themselves, to them to entertain themselves, but also as a site that became sort of a stage. You no, know? this is a highly scenographic environment with these two semicircular um, structures that go up and down, showing the penguins' bodies, showing them how they go up and down, and also having the stairs on the sign. So this is at the same same time an exhibitionary apparatus, a stage, and of course a, a confinement site as it can be, and a panopticon confinement site. See how the circularity of the structure also allows for visitors to stand all around its perimeter. And also a, a device that in itself is performing the qualities of these engineering, of these materials, of um, um, the possibilities of these environments. No? Um, And here we have Bertolt Lubetkin, the older phase of his life with a, with a penguin. No? Um, and this, ironically, this structure stayed, um, was active until very long, and now it's not. The penguins are not used, are not using it anymore, and they've been displaced um, to Whipsnake because it was proven that um, the, the contact of the penguins' feet with these concrete surfaces that were constantly exposed to humidity and water um, generated infections, bacteria led infections in the penguins feet. Um, and so with time they were they were removed from, from the site. But for a long time, this the penguin Lubetkin's penguin pool, which was built in 1934, was a, a site of um of pride and of exhibition of these outstanding potentials of these um, modernist architecture in order to, to create a structure that could also serve humans, having proved that it was capable of serving um, non-humans um, so efficiently. Um, another major exhibition site that was commissioned by the London Zoological Society um, during this period, and it was made in a record time. This, these, it's incredible how these, how these environments were commissioned and conceived and built and started to be used in the space of two years, which is unheard of. And, and another one was exactly a site that was commissioned to host two gorillas called Mok and Moina, which you see here, that in 1932 were acquired by the London Zoological Society. Now these, these two gorillas were taken from the wild. These days, um, these days zoos across the world, they cannot, they cannot get animals from the wild anymore. The, the animals um, that they exhibit are, they have to be integrated in, in very regulated um, policies of, of breathing that happen between zoos. But at the time, these animals came from the wild, they came from Congo. And, uh, and when they, they arrived, so they were abducted from their environment. Uh, from and they were taken from a site that in itself was a site that was under um, that had a huge history of, of colonial occupation. So these were exactly two animals that were tropes of this colonial persistence, insistence, and relationship that existed between Europe and, and Africa. No? They arrived to the London Zoological Society, and the London Zoological Society doesn't have a place for them. So in the beginning, they stay in the Lemur House, but the Lemur House is too small for them. And um, it is fundamental for the London Zoological Society that they have space to exist so that they could breathe. Um, and um, until so, um, the again, um, there is a commission for the construction of a, a gorilla house to host these two, this couple. Um, again, the commission is made to uh, to Lubetkin, who together with Tecton, 
built one of the most, at the time, one of the most sophisticated buildings of modern architecture in Britain, which is this gorilla house, which is a building that has a unique system at the time of air conditioning that has a, a very peculiar, uh, that establishes a very peculiar relationship between indoors and outdoors, also thinking a, a seasonal change of the building that in the winter it would be closed and in the summer it would open to allow the gorillas to have access to fresh air. And also that allowed for a circulation of visitors who could see the gorillas both in the summer and in the winter um, while having enough distance for their diseases, for their viruses not to be, um, to be kept so there was a, a high degree of separation not to allow for, for diseases, for, the, for the, the two animals to receive human diseases. It's very interesting. I love this photo because you can see on the left the huge contrast between the previous and the existing at the time structures of the zoo. This is an image from 1934 when, um, when the, the, the gorilla house was finished and the relationship between the other structures of the zoo and the modern gorilla house is, is immense. No? And we really see that there was a, a huge effort in, in creating this modern environment, an environment that ideologically was also trying to prove that these animals did not have to be an in an environment that resembled the jungle in Congo where they were originally living, but actually that their living conditions had been improved. So what we see here is also a logic of um, a logic of perpetuation and almost, I would even say, legitimization of colonialism, in which we see how these two displaced animals come from the jungle and are exhibited in a healthy manner, in this hygienic, clean, modern environment, as if they had been upgraded to a safer, cleaner, more controlled, better, more progressive environment, um, an ideology that would then be applied to justify um, the a transition towards modern architecture in the UK. So by seeing how these two animals were living in better conditions, this was also inviting people to understand the possibilities of also having social emancipation through architecture and through uh, modern design. It's fascinating because Lubetkin was in, in the making of this uh, gorilla house. Nowadays, one, one of the very, so this, this gorilla house is not active anymore at the London Zoo. And one of the very few ways to see it is if you see a, a map of the, of the London Zoo, you could identify the circular form in, in space. Otherwise, it's very, it's very difficult to identify the building. But what's interesting is that Lubetkin, while making it, he inspired himself in a pavilion made in the 1930s by Le Corbusier, which is this one that I'm showing you here. And I'm sure you can see the affinity of shapes, but where you also see that there is a, a huge effort in integrating the building within its settings and by having this tree that is growing in, in the middle of it. So also understanding how this architecture could integrate, could dialogue with, could exist in, close, very close connection in intimacy with, um, with nature around it. Um, another uh, building much later, and uh, I, um, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time here because I'm, I became suddenly aware of time, but that was also part of these plans of thinking how architecture could improve and radically change the dwelling conditions of these animals while being still a site that is more a site of a stage, a very spectacular stage, rather than a site for scientific observation. And some of the critiques that had been made um, in relation to these modern buildings were exactly the fact that they were transforming the site of the zoo, not in the site of education, learning and science, but in the site of spectacle and entertainment. Um, is the aviarium, 
which I'm sure um, those of you who have passed by London or you're familiar with, because you can even see it while walking uh, across, across the canal near the zoo by uh, visionary architect Cedric Price is actually one of the very few constructions that were made by Cedric Price in which you see this kind of a abstract, it's, for me it seems like almost like a drawing that was turned into a three-dimensional structure and this abstract form imposing itself in its surrounding environments, in its radical difference between abstraction and the original forms of nature that were made to, to host these to host these animals. Now, um, something really curious about, um, about these buildings is that the information about them circulated very quickly. And in um, not, um, not long after they were, they were made, there was an exhibition uh, in 1936, which was curated by Alfred Barr, the first director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And the, the exhibition was called New Architecture, New British Architecture. And one of um, the core um, case studies of this British architecture exhibition was exactly the London Zoo and the different buildings made by Lubetkin and, and Tecton for the London Zoo. Um, and during this show, this is an image of the show at the moment, and during this show, um, one of the one of the um, objects that was commissioned, apart from the photographic documentation, was a film. And this film was commissioned exactly to one of the Bauhaus emigres who was in London, which was uh, Laszlo Moholinet, who most people know uh, in relation to his photographic work. He was actually a metal professor at the Bauhaus. Then he came to, to London, where he made actually two films, this, this film in relation to the architecture of the London Zoo, and another film that documents um, lobster fishing, um, lobster fishing in, in the UK, in Sussex, actually. Um, and, um, and then he, he, he moved to the US and he continued his work with photography, with uh, relationship between photography and volumes and movement. Um, and it is fascinating that the MoMA, in while preparing this 1936 um, exhibition on, on, um, on British modern architecture, they commissioned Laszlo Moholinaj to make a film about uh, the new architecture of the London Zoo, um, and in which we observe the attentiveness uh, that Moholinaj pays to the way these buildings modulate space. These buildings create a relationship between geometry, light, shadows, and spectacle. No? And um, how they, uh, the, the films exactly attend to these very dynamic, very, uh, let's say, cinetic, elements of the different buildings where different times of day, different lights, different light sources, different movements of the audiences really activate and turn these buildings alive. So what we, we see, and I would like to, to end this talk before we, we have a moment of questions and answers, is exactly a film that is understanding or trying to understand how modern buildings create different relationships between people, um, movements and, and, and the inside and their outside. And, and how it's almost as if Mohardi Nash makes a portrait of the social life of modernist architecture and of modern architecture in general through, these, um, through this short film that documents the new buildings of the London Zoo, both in its London and Whipsnade um, venues. Now the film has no sound. So I will, um, so just for you to, to know, uh, um, I was planning to show this one as well, but I, I can't, I don't have, I don't have time. So, um, but Mary and me, the film lasts for five minutes. And then we will um, we will open up to to some questions.
Okay, so after this. Thank you so much. Um, Philippa, can you see the questions in the chat? I can. Brilliant. Um, um, and was there anything you wanted to add to the video um, afterwards? Or happy to go straight into questions? I can go straight into questions, I think. Brilliant. So there's a quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I'll work through them in chronological order. So Fowler's asked, to what extent has the animal as an entertainment and exhibit framed our understanding of zoo architecture in the 21st century? So maybe then I will go one by one. To yeah. See what different. So um, thank you for that. Um, thank you for that uh, question. I think it's a I think it's a question that would deserve research, um, or it, it could be a one. It could be the beginning of a, a big research. Um, and um, I do think that there are some some exemplar cases of very spectacular zoo architecture. I'm thinking, for instance, of the one of the images I showed was an elephant house, which is the elephant house in the Copenhagen Zoo, which was done by Foster and Partners, by Norman Foster and, and his company. And that is a very good example of um, how the continuation of the conception of the animal as a, a entertainment figure who provides amusement and distraction and curiosity and access to something that generally we don't have access to. Um, how this, the perpetuation of this conception of the figure of the exotic animal has led to massive investments in zoo architecture in the case of course of wealthy, we're talking about the context of wealthy, uh, of wealthy zoos, which mostly are in between Europe and Southeast Asia, say in the US some cases, but the cases I know are more in Europe and Asia. And, um, and both the cases of Foster's Elephant House in Copenhagen, and also of the Panda House in the Copenhagen Zoo, which was made by an architecture firm called Big, B-I-G, um, are, um, important examples of how the, the entertainment uh, exhibitionary status of the zoo animal has led to monumental architectures that at the same time as they're very distanced from any kind of conception of their replication of the natural environment, they are made to create outlandish, very spectacular settings that complement the vision of the animal to, to such an extent that the visit of the zoo becomes not only a site, uh, an experience to encounter these animals, but also to encounter a very spectacular, um, very spectacular architectures that are, that are as imposing and are as important as an experience to the zoo than that of the encounter with the animals. So I would say that this transformation, almost an ontological transformation of the zoo animal, which is no longer a wild animal, no long, it's not a pet, is not a pest, is not a feral creature, but it's certainly not a wild animal. It's almost an animal that exists, that owes their existence to their performing of their own self, like a normal specimen. So that animal is there to exemplify what our idea of an animal, of an elephant is, is accompanied by these quite overwhelming architectural constructions that complement these, these encounters with these, with these specimens that are considered like entertainment or tropes for entertainment or um, um, spectacle. Yes, I would say so. Thank you. Um, and then following up 
from that, Pippa had asked the question, which came to my mind as well, about whether there was a true consideration from Lebetkin and Tecton about the needs of the animals, or was it primarily an architectural experiment, I suppose, for architecture's sake, with very little consideration of the animals' needs? And that's a very good question. And I think when we when we approach zoo studies and um, exhibition studies of living beings, we need to consider that what we're creating is not only a building and not only the building's relationship to an individual or to a set of individuals, but we're actually creating a new ecology. So, for instance, Mock and Moyner, the two gorillas that came to the London Zoo in 1932 and who were performing this kind of possibility of individuals to thrive in the hygienic, clean, geometric sites of modern architecture, they died of complications related to their poor, um, to their, to the way they were fed. So one, uh, one of them died with liver complications, and the other had also a series of infections related to their poor, uh, the way they were poorly fed. They were given rum, they were given eggs, for instance. And of course, these animals were having, were being fed as if they were, let's say, middle class individuals. So as exactly in the same way as if uh, in which they were placed in a site that was meant to provide middle upper classes with a good way of living, they were also fed with a similar kind of food. And of course, these were not, they were not prepared, they were not biologically prepared to eat this. So whether or not, this is the ongoing question, is whether or not shall, shall we use time to justify lack of knowledge, lack of empathy, and lack of care, or if we should attend to the progress of science and to the progress of scientific knowledge is, is an ongoing question because we don't know. What we, what we do know is that the, what, what was thought were the needs of these animals is very different from what now we think we know or we think we know are the needs and requirements of these animals in terms of space, in terms of um, materials, in terms of temperatures, in terms of food, in terms of mental stimulation. And clearly, I would say that the priority was an experiment with materials and architecture and not an experiment or not an attempt to improve animal well-being. There was this utopic belief that modern design, modern architecture would help improve society and would contribute to the emancipation of society, but it was more wishful thinking. In its practical way, um, much was done to display the applications of new materials, such as concrete, for instance. Now, having said this, there are certain elements, as for instance, the um, giving priority to access to light and fresh air were two hugely important innovations that many of these buildings allowed for. The fact that the belief that animals as well as humans, needed light and needed fresh air because both of them were very much related to that very important um, element of, of modernism that is hygiene. No, Hygiene is achieved largely thanks to light and to fresh air. And this was something that these many of these buildings were certainly providing and or were providing much more than their previous dwellings. And this was indeed an improvement. So there are concrete improvements that have more to do with livability than with understanding the effects of materials in the physical and physiological need of these animals. You know? So it's just the fact of not considering that concrete could be highly aggressive to the paws of a penguin, for instance, which is, we would very easily reach those conclusions these days, and they didn't, 
in the 1930s, but still there were some improvements. But an overall ecology of, of improvement was not done, would not it would not be the same today. So. No, of course. And it's interesting hearing you speak about kind of the light <clears throat> and fresh air, and of course those kind of manifested themselves massively in buildings such as the Delaware Pavilion itself, which obviously for humans doesn't have it, well any damaging effects. Um, but there was that same kind of modernist idea of improving kind of the well-being of people, both emotionally and physically, um, through this building with the light and space, um, which obviously you can see kind of play out through what Tecton was doing at London Zoo. Um, we, um, if I may just add, and it's I think it's particularly interesting that this that this presentation, this conversation is taking place in relation to the, the Delaware Pavilion, who shares an architectonic tradition and thinking as a space that is relating to a fresh, the outside environment, to a natural environment, to the sea. The form of the pavilion is a form that shapes very much the um, enclosures that we encounter in zoological gardens. So there is an affinity where the exhibitionary, the conception of, of of health tr being transformed throughout times um, that is very much shared. Yes, absolutely. Um, just to finish off, there's been a couple of questions about from Felicity and from Catherine about the relationship between the housing of animals in the zoo settings, which showed off their aesthetic qualities and objectifies them rather than meeting their actual needs in relation to the kind of white cube gallery spaces where, as Felicity said, curators kind of present work and decide how it's viewed by the public. Um, there's obviously a lot to unpack there, but do you think there's any, have you got a kind of thought or opinion on that and whether there's any relationship? There are many relationships. And in fact, Catherine, um, and thank you for that, for that comment, touches upon, an artist that generally we wouldn't associate with, or we wouldn't associate the work of Mike Kelly with a knowledge and an interest, not only in, in the history of animals, but also in the history of science's relation to animals in its experiments, in its development forms of knowledge, but also in its forms of care slash cruelty. And in fact, Catherine is alluding to to an, an installation, a work by Mike Kelly. I saw it years ago. And I believe I saw it in an exhibition at the Hayward called Laughing in a Foreign Language, if I'm not wrong, where the whole uh, environment was could be activated and was presented there and where we see that the relationship between spectacle, entertainment, uh, amusement and slash violence are in a constant tension and process of negotiation, which, and Mike Kelly has written extensively about that. And in fact, one of the texts that he wrote and informing himself extensively as he did throughout his research and development of his projects, a text that he wrote on, on the whole Harlow experiments, I, I included in the animal book I published some years ago. And in fact, that ongoing tension between the vi exhibitionary violence, the tension and the, let's say, the tension of the performative, the, and the violence of the exhibitionary apparatus is something that is shared, in my opinion, between museological and zoological displays in a history that could be brought much closer because the politics of display at the end, they're not that the politics, the agencies, the aims of artistic display or zoological display are deeply connected with one another. The relationships that they stay establish with public in assuring closeness, permanent visibility, access, but also the prevention of a relationship of intimacy, for instance, the rendering of something into a, a, the objectification of what is exhibited, you no? Know? The relationship with spectacle and so on and so forth are, are a permanent, are in permanent dimension, are in permanent tension 
throughout um, throughout the history of 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 exhibitionary models, and I can think of other of other artistic cases. I'm thinking about the case of of Joan Jonas, for instance, who Catherine also knows uh, very well, um, who in her performances, in in her works, has often included not only performative collaborations with her companion dogs, but also uh, included footage that she shot in aquarium and in animal observation sites, and that at the same time as question and make us um, be aware of the violence inherent, in, inherent to, that, to those exhibition sites, they also perpetuate that violence by replicating them and once more showing these animals that are being presented without even knowing that they're being presented, no? and, and without this relationship, even a haptic or visual relationship being, being, being produced by being mediated by video. No? So I do think that we are telling a story that is that is there is very much the same and that has ramifications where the artistic and the zoological assume have different details and assume different narratives but that they share very much the same the same roots and the same traditions of the fascination but also violence of putting things on display or of putting something on display that becomes a thing absolutely um that's really interesting and i my my mind's thinking about kind of museum contexts as well and obviously there's a similar question that can be asked there um when items are kind of uprooted and displayed just to finalize um as we have run over time a little bit, and thank you everyone who's still listening. Um, Phillips asks, are there any examples of the Bauhaus influence extending to furnishings at the zoos, I guess either for humans or for animals within the enclosures, or was it purely the kind of larger structures? I think it's interesting. Artist, um, a London-based artist from Argentina, Amalia Pica, has recently been making a series of works uh, where she actually, it's actually found objects. She acquires objects that are made, that are conceived and sold for zoos as objects to entertain animals, either for them to play or for the caretakers to include some meat or some elements inside them that then the animals have to interact with also just to spend their time and the shapes I was fascinated to look at this exhibition that Amalia had a couple of years ago at Herald Street and because the shapes of these objects they they are sculptural objects in themselves and they are sculptural objects that come directly from, from a modernist relationship of, of conceiving shapes and relationship between concreteness, um, geometry and abstraction. So while I don't have any specific examples of um, the furniture, the furnishings um, remaining or, or being made during the, the Bauhaus, the work that was made with the London Zoo um, in London, I do think that this period of applying and experimenting with technical and formal innovations in zoo architecture extended also to the conception of, of objects and of other elements that retain those formal and functional, the relationship between form and functional, and function that were so important for the whole um, aesthetics and for the whole conceptualization of what the ways in which the Bauhaus could improve uh, life through design and architecture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, we will we will wrap up there as we've gone over slightly, and I I know personally I could go on for kind of ages with questions. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sure everybody will join me in wanting to say a massive thank you for your time and your insights. It's been really, really, really interesting. And hopefully we can welcome you to Bexhill at some point um, in the future. 
I'm sure it would be wonderful to have another talk or for you to visit the pavilion when possible. Um, everyone, thank you again for coming. There'll be a survey that goes out afterwards by email. Please do take the time to let us know what you think, as it will really, really help us plan future events like this for our members and for our patrons, as well as for our wider audiences. Um, the recording will be shared on YouTube if you want to come back and listen to any of it um, again. And I hope you will enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. And thank you, Philippa. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Dan, for the invitation. And indeed, I hope to come in person to the pavilion very soon. Have a nice thank evening. Thank you, everybody. Love you. Thank you very much indeed. Really interesting Cheers. session. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thanks. <laughs>